Hi, I'm Chris Van Hollen. I want to thank all of you uh, who are joining uh, this conversation uh, today on a very important topic, uh, which is the long-term unemployed. And I'm really pleased uh, that we're joined here today by two individuals uh, who have devoted themselves uh, to helping working people, um, especially those who have been most left out. Uh, we're joined by Mark Morial and Melissa Young. Uh, Mark Morial uh, has been a real uh, friend uh, for a long time and somebody who's been uh, in the trenches and, and leading the fight um, as the president of the National Urban League. Uh, and as I think everyone knows, uh, the National Urban League has been at the forefront of the fight uh, for people who are living in urban areas uh, and especially those uh, who have been left out in so many ways uh, from economic progress. So it's wonderful to have uh, Mark Morial here. Uh, Melissa Young has uh, also worked with us on legislation uh, to address these issues. And uh, she is the Senior Director of Research and Policy at the Heartland Alliance, which is one of our nation's leading anti-poverty organizations. So great to have you both here. Uh, as we know, long-term unemployment was a real problem even before the pandemic. Um, and long-term unemployment really refers to people who have been looking for work uh, for more than six months and unable to find a job. And the, the more time goes on, we know the harder it is for them to get back in the workforce. And there were over a million people who were in that category before the pandemic. Uh, but now we've seen record numbers of people join the ranks of the long-term unemployed. So it is now up to 3.5 million of our fellow Americans. And the challenge here is to make sure that as the economy recovers, uh, that we bring these individuals into the workforce uh, so th they don't remain locked out. Uh, and that's why we're really grateful that both of you worked with us, uh, with Senator Ron White and myself, uh, to form the legislation called the Long-Term Unemployment Elimination Act. And appreciate your really leading us in this conversation here. So I I'd just like to start, uh, Mark, with you. Uh, and if you could talk about in the context of this pandemic, um, we, we know on the healthcare front, it's had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. Uh, we've also seen that same harmful impact on the economic front. So talk a little bit about yeah. why the economic pain is falling so disproportionately in certain communities. So uh, Senator, thank you so very much for doing this and for uh, your fight and work on the legislation. Melissa, great to be with you and thank you for your energy and effort. Think about the pandemic and think about the impact it's had. So you're a a worker for, I'll use it, American or United Airlines. And all of a sudden, the pandemic hits, travel slows, and you're laid off. And you've been, and this is the tragedy of it, you've been stably employed for a long, long period of time. And what is the impact? Well, maybe you can collect unemployment for a short period of time, but not indefinitely. That for which you are trained uh, is, is work that has, has, has basically gone away across the board. You're on the edge of foreclosure. You become food insecure. Uh, or if you're a renter, you're on the edge of eviction. And the human toll that it takes, uh, I have found that uh, for those who become long-term unemployed after a period of employment where they've been used to being stably employed, it's an embarrassment. It is a uh, pride buster. Uh, it is a uh, 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 creates uh, psychological and emotional pressure. Uh, we've got to understand that many of the long-term unemployed particularly in this environment, are not there because they want to be there. And think about the profile. So in that sector, the service sector, hotels, hospitality, 
uh, restaurants, eating establishments, uh, those jobs are disproportionately black and brown. They're also disproportionately women yes. with children, young women with children. And sometimes there's a stereotype that the long-term unemployed is a shiftless, unmotivated person looking for some for some place to hang. And we've got to paint the picture uh, that uh, the long-term unemployed are people who are the backbone of communities and find themselves. And in some instances, they also become long-term unemployed because the factory, the job, the business that they work for has moved on and changed. And the new jobs, they're not prepared for. Mm -hmm. They're not trained for it. It's easy to say to a 40-year-old, hey, why don't you go get some training? Why don't you go learn? And the 40-year-old says, I'm a very competent, hardworking, skilled worker. What do you mean I got to go spend $10,000 and go to community college? Go to school, get a credential, go take a bunch of classes. And, and if I do that, am I guaranteed? So we, we, we have to, in this instance, I think it's important. There are many, many type. I've used a few examples of uh, who may be long-term unemployed, but Think about it, a person in uh, in the restaurant business or in the hospitality business or working at a hotel may have been laid off in March and they're still out of work. Sorry. They're still out of work and, and they're looking and, and, and they've got to not only find the job, they got to find a job in this market where they are, they have family, they have roots, they may have responsibilities. So we've got to, you know, really, uh, really understand, uh, and and that's why uh, what you're doing to provide uh, response and relief to it is so important. But I, it, it's a battle, Senator and, and Melissa, to disavow the stereotypes of those without work. Yeah, we, you know, there's always there, there are people who don't want to work, but to suggest that that's the main or that's the majority is, is, is cruel and unusual. It, it is absolutely cruel and unusual. And uh, I, I think we need, as you say, to be doing two things right now during this pandemic. Um, you know, for everybody that's been you know, thrown out of work uh, or lost their job because of the pandemic, we've got to extend that emergency unemployment uh, insurance, uh, which expires at yes. the end of yes. this mm -hmm. month. Um, that is essential. Uh, and then as we work to rebuild the economy and we have the vaccines deployed, uh, I'm worried about all the people you're talking about right now, Mark, be falling behind, right? The stock market That's looks right. good. The economy looks like it's coming back um, in terms of growth. But this long-term unemployment number could be very uh, sticky um, unless we all work together to make sure uh, that uh, we, we provide opportunities. So, you know, Melissa, what is the challenge here? Um, and what, what kind of things are we going to need to, to do uh, to make sure that this long-term unemployment uh, challenge doesn't become even worse. Yeah, well, first, thank you so much, Senator, for your leadership in this space. Um, it's been an absolute joy to work with you um, on this legislation and other things. And and Mark, for, for this opportunity, it's wonderful to be with you tonight. Um, I think one of the things I've been thinking about a lot um, with COVID um, is that in many ways, and, and Mark, you articulated it and, and gave some stories that I think um, are just so critical to to what I've been talking about and thinking about it, um, about taking off the rose colored glasses that some folks have been sporting around the strength of our economy, right? And yeah. the ways in which our economy, um, quite frankly, doesn't work for everyone, right? And what we're doing and what we have done, we cannot repeat. 
right? Um, I mean, the data bears this out, which we talked about. Um, the numbers of individuals filing for unemployment insurance, um, it continues to go up. Um, the numbers of women leaving the labor market, in fact, many of those women uh, largely being Black women. Um, the numbers of youth who are unemployed reaching absolutely staggering um, um, numbers. And, and we, those are policy choices, right? Those are not anomalies. They're not accidents. They are policy choices. This is, this is something that we can fix, right? And, and so when I think about, you know, the challenges that our participants at Heartland Alliance face or other uh, challenges that participants and individuals face in getting into the labor market and getting back into the labor market, um, the first thing, and, and Mark raised this, is that people want to work, and we need, we need to disavow that myth immediately. Um, secondly, is that what stands in the way of people getting back into the labor market are the very things that make it so that each of us, many of us, can actually go to work, right? Um, it's um, having um, adequate transportation, right, when we need it, or having access to good jobs that pay enough to keep a stable roof over, over our heads and food on the table, and so that we don't need to make a choice between paying our rent or our mortgage and, and turning on and keeping the lights on, right? I mean, these are ways that people can access good jobs and stay in good jobs. Um, and I'd be remiss, you know, in this conversation too, to just not to, to highlight that, you know, also in this country, we bar millions of individuals, hard working individuals from getting access to jobs because of what I talk about as the go-go gadget arms of the criminal legal system, right? Um, the arms of our criminal legal system wrap around and reach out to folks long after their, their involvement in the criminal justice system. Um, to bar access to jobs, oftentimes for a lifetime, right? And so even if the economy recovers, these are challenges that individuals face in communities and many individuals are facing today and have faced long before COVID. Um, so I think one of the things that we have to do when we're talking about economic recovery is build differently, right? We need to build better and we need to build differently um, because we um, it is imperative for our democracy, um, for communities, for families, for individuals to bring folks from the sidelines back into the labor market. Yeah. Well, that's a, a great segue into what I was going to ask, because both your organizations um, have very strong public policy shops uh, where you make important recommendations. Um, but you also have uh, service, uh, you know, components uh, to your organizations. And so, Mark, in your experience, um, what are the kind of supports that are necessary in order to make sure that these individuals who want to work um, are, are able to, you know, we can knock down the barriers that, that so that they're able to enter the workforce? No, I, I, I just love the people programs that we run at the National Urban League because it's where you can see a difference made in a person's life. And uh, the way our work evolves is that it's based on an individual assessment and an individual plan. So if all three of us walked in my plan may look different than yours, maybe look different than Melissa's. It's going to be tailored according to my skills, my aspirations, my desires, my abilities. And then what do I need to get from point A to point B? So, you know, if we need to help someone because they've got an alcohol and drug issue, we're going to do that. If they have low literacy and they need GED, we're going to do that. Uh, if, uh, if they're ready, uh, for employment from a skills base, but they have soft skills issues. We have soft skills programs. So just trying to work directly with people. And we, we work to put people in tech jobs. We would work to put people in hospitality jobs, construction jobs, uh, lots of tech work now, but it's, it's, it's basically based on the market where the program operates, where are the opportunities? And, you know, I'm a big believer in pragmatic preparation. Let's prepare people for something that's real. 
Like not something that's imagined. You, you know, let's let's prepare. They want to work. They want to earn money. They want to just say, I know how to do X, Y, and Z. And so uh, I think it's a really you know, critical part, these direct services. But let me make this point about direct services programs and centers. I've made this point uh, before, uh, before committees in the House uh, over the years. And that is people say, well, if you have all these great programs, why do we have long-term unemployed and poverty? I said, scale, man. Scale. I got a great program, reentry program in Chicago. I serve 50 people. Okay, 50 people in a six month cycle. How many people need it? 2,000, 3,000? I said, it's scale. We think when it comes to investments in people, in programs that help people get out of poverty, we never want to think in terms of scale. We want to think in terms of pilots and we want to think in terms of demonstration projects and we want to think in terms of initiatives and we don't want to think in terms of scale and I think some scaling uh, is what's necessary uh, we know Melissa you know uh, what works okay. you know it works yeah we know it works and we have evidence that it works but its scale is not wide enough and large enough to, to have to move the needle in the way we need to move the needle the final thing I'll say and I think this is important I just have a hard time uh, understanding why a country with such an enormity of wealth, goodwill, human talent would tolerate poverty. Why would you tolerate high levels of poverty? Why would you disinvest in the great American urban metropolises, you know, big and small right, in, in America, when they're what we're known for. We're known for New York and Baltimore and Philadelphia and Chicago. And we're known for smaller communities like Macon and Springfield. The world knows us. You know, the world may not know Illinois. They sure know Chicago. They may not know Pennsylvania, but they know the city of brotherly love. And uh, and so, you know, it is important to understand that we have to invest in those communities to a greater extent than we have. And hopefully in this environment, Senator, notwithstanding some of the opposition you and I referenced before we joined, uh, joined the air tonight, uh, we have to press. We have to push right. uh, and, and, and understand that this is not these what we're talking about is not left or right it's common sense that's right yep yeah plain well, old common sense 100 percent. it is it is it is totally common sense and as you as you say the, the failure to make to to ensure the failure to ensure that we have vibrant cities is a choice that's because right. there are things we can be doing right now uh to help change that um, in dramatic ways. Um, and you raised the issue of scale. Uh, and so that really does bring us to this next um, question here, because, you know, we can have successful grant programs, and I know both of your organizations have them. But as you just said, Mark, you could be helping 50 people with a grant program. Uh, but to do this at scale, I do believe we need significant federal resources. And I'm going to ask Melissa, but I just want to, I, I always remember that in 2008, uh, during the, you know, economic meltdown, uh, when we had the economic recovery bill, one of the programs was to help federal funds to help subsidize jobs. And Haley Barber. That's right. <laughs> Haley Barber, That's the right. governor of Mississippi, <laughs> was the, I remember was that. the guy who championed that program. He said, this works. So maybe, Melissa, can you talk about uh, you know, taking this to scale and the role the federal government can play. Yeah, I remember. It's so funny. So you just um, triggered all kinds of memories um, because in the uh, over the Christmas holiday, um, uh, going from 08 to 09, I was writing part of that ARA legislation that included some of that those subsidized employment um, components. Um, so you just, yeah. Um, and, and it's true. We saw these programs be implemented across the country, putting about 260 or so thousand folks into jobs. Um, 
in red states and blue states, because as you said, Senator, it's common sense, right? Um, I think one of the things that a key lesson that we learned from um, the Great Recession um, is that the private sector um, is not going to generate the new jobs that we need to make a full recovery and adequately address um, quality jobs as well, right? And I think so when we think about um, what the, the, the power of um, jobs programs at the federal level, we need to ex be able to expand the quantity of good jobs and the quality of jobs. And we, you know, I've been talking about this a lot with folks. Um, I think this begins to come down to using all of the mechanisms that we have at the federal government to make a commitment to economic ju economic justice um, in the Biden Harris administration, and that really is um, flows through all parts of the administration. But I'm glad, Mark, that you talked a little bit about um, about scale. I think you know there's a scope, scale, and duration um, issue, right? One of the things we learned in the Great Recession is that a lot of these jobs programs that were putting people back to work, that were good for business, um, that were good for communities, that were good for taxpayers, right, um, ended too soon before folks were soon. Able, yeah before folks were able to make a full recovery um so i think that is something that should stick with us right not only scope and scale but duration um and also you know we know that these programs and we also know that the federal government has the power to eliminate barriers that prevent folks from accessing these jobs right or getting a foothold in the jobs in the first place um, and I hope, you know, I've been talking a little bit about building differently, but I think we have this opportunity um, as we think about the future of some of these subsidized employment programs and as we think towards the future of this legislation and others to build differently by co-creating with communities who have been economically marginalized um, and really doubling down and saying, what is it that you need and want? How can we, uh, through the federal government, um, build economically vibrant communities? through these subsidized employment programs. Um, and so I think we have a, a, an opportunity. There. You know, our uh, chief economics advisor, mm. uh, Dr. Bernard Anderson, Professor Emeritus from the Wharton School, a labor economist, former assistant secretary of labor for Bill Clinton, has pounded into my head since 2008 the notion of public service jobs. Yeah and has said repeatedly that it is one of the most powerful stimulus initiatives you could undertake because these folks are going to spend 70 percent of the, their earnings right back in that's right through the economy and you know we advanced uh in uh, the early days of obama we couldn't get any real traction on it a public service jobs initiative which would have uh allowed uh, public service jobs to be placed at universities mm -hmm. community colleges city governments state agencies and cultural facilities you know art museums etc cetera, etc cetera. and and we couldn't get and you know i, I think it was uh you know it, it, the the thinking has to do with the stereotypes and the cynicisms sure somehow people you know want to want to People said people are looking for nothing, something for nothing. And, uh, you know, so many of these folks are mothers. Right. They're right. moms. That's right. And in, in our experience, I, and you talked a little bit about it, Mark, too, in our experience, when we offer an opportunity for folks to work, they take it over and over again. Right. They take it. Um, they take it. Um, when you offer a low barrier opportunity to work, folks are like, yes, that's what I want to do. And, and I think that that is um, that gets at some of this myth. Right. Um, and we can look at almost every single evaluation of these kinds of programs dating back way, 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 way back. back. Right. You give somebody an opportunity to work and they take it. And so um, I'm with you. Like, let's just like debunk that like i let's put that on and I think, shelf you know i think you know? we have to you know S senator van holland is in a in a great position because as a champion of this you know these types of things get funded through uh you know large scale stimulus omnibus recovery type acts 
where people are looking, where multiple things can get uh, embedded. Uh, I, I think it, you know, it's, there's a thing. We have to try some new things. Yeah. So at the end we, of the day, there's an insanity in continuing to do the same damn thing. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. and, and looking and, for another and, result. And, and that mm -hmm. does bring me to this, the, 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 the last question here. And, you know, both of you and your organizations have, have worked on this legislation. And, you know, to Melissa's point and your point, Mark, doing programs just in response to an emergency, if they're not sustained, then they're not durable. Um, you, need, you need the duration component to go with this. Uh, it can't just be a flash in the pan. It, it's true that it's important to help people in an emergency. But the whole issue with long-term unemployment is that it's right. an ongoing chronic problem. And yeah, these are right. people right. who right. want to work, as you say, by definition, in order to, to, qualify, to say you're unemployed, you have to be looking for work. Um, there are a lot more people who are not long-term unemployed who were, who fell out of the workforce because they got discouraged. And we would like to bring them back in too. And that's why we think we need this sort of quantum change, this big change that you're talking about, uh, Mark, with this, this bill. And it would call for substantial, essentially, you know, job sharing costs. The federal government uh, would help subsidize the, the costs of employment. When unemployment rates are low all around the country, uh, it would be a two thirds match. This is over a two year period. The idea is, as we say, people want a chance. They want to get they want to get into the workforce. They want a job. We're going to provide some financial help to employers to hire them, whether they're in the private sector or public sector or nonprofit sector and provide the supports. You know, you got to be able to get transportation to get to work. You need to make sure that uh, we knock down the barriers. But we need a we need a system wide that's approach, right. not a program. You approach. know, Senator, I'm thinking talk that, a little bit uh, about that. That a business sector that I think could be mobilized to support this might be the airline and hospitality industry, uh, because you know it, it, it would be a way to support them getting back on their feet if the government provided uh, subsidies to them, right, as a part of a package uh, to provide uh, public service job support for cities and states and. And, and nonprofits also, but if, if you had an industry uh, who, because uh, uh, this, what you're talking about is not a loan. No. You're not talking about a loan. And, and I, think, I think it needs to be, because I think it's worth, I have noticed, and you know, glimmers of that there's a different type of CEO sitting in the in the suites of some American businesses now. They are from a different generation. Uh, they're not as wedded to yesterday's thinking. They've got to manage in a pandemic, and they may be open to new new and different ways. Yeah, uh, they may be responsive to an invitation uh, from. Uh, you and, 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 and the president-elect to sit around the table and consider some new ideas if it will huh. benefit, you know, their business, yep. if it will benefit right. them getting back on their feet. I mean, it's about finding the right angle and, uh, and, and, and doing it now, but you're right. It needs to be long-term. It needs to be sustainable. And uh, uh, a great nation like ours should not have poverty and long-term unemployment, period. That's right. Yeah, full stop. Full stop, right? I mean, I Absolutely. think one of the thing, I think one of the things that you said, Senator, that um, you know, really, I think is so true and also sparked something for me, which is um, that this isn't a flash in the pan program, right? This is a a system, right? And the only way we are going to have transformational, transformational, transformational kinds of change when we think about things like long term unemployment is to build systems. Right, because um, systems behave in exactly the ways that we construct them to behave. Right, um, and so um, I think that's actually what's so exciting 
about this piece of legislation um, is the way that it's structured to address uh, long-term unemployment, to address crises, and also to address what we know are structural barriers to employment, right? Like we've talked about tonight, right? Things like transportation or childcare access or, um, you know, having a criminal record, right? And so I think that's really important because that's when you begin to act to, to make change, right? And for me, I mean, I'm just sitting in sitting in my seat, right? I mean, like getting people back to work who might be sitting on the sidelines, that's that's good for all of us, right? That is a fundamentally a bipartisan idea, right? Let's yeah. let's get folks who wow. are on the sideline back to work. We have to push the needle for a, yeah. new, a new way of thinking about economic policy. That's right. I mean, this is what we're talking about. We've, we've lived through an era where, you know, it was, you know, give a little tax incentive, do a little something over here. It, 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 was, it was what I call small bore, uh, not big thinking, not imaginative thinking, not understanding the fundamental of the American economy is consumer spending. And if people have money in their pocket, they will spend money. They will buy groceries. They will pay rent. They will buy diapers. Uh, they will buy uh, a formula. They will go to Bed Bath & Beyond or Costco's or Big Lots or uh, wherever they shop, right? They're going to spend some money. They're going to spend some money. And that's the, yeah. that's the driver of the economy. And so when people are working and they have a job, they also have pride, dignity self-worth standing all of that all of that comes with the job you know the ability to support yourself um, your, mm -hmm. your loved ones and as we've been saying the the idea behind this legislation is it's system-wide change uh, as as melissa and you have said um it, it's not just a, a, a as much you know, good on a very localized basis that a grant program can do. This is economy wide. This is system wide. Yeah. Right. This is changing incentives to make sure that people who want to work, uh, but for a whole host of reasons, barriers um, have been sort of left behind. And the longer they're left behind, you know, the harder it is for them to get back up and into the workforce. And so this is mm -hmm. designed uh, to make sure that we, we change that dynamic. Because I'm very nervous that as we come out of the, the pandemic and we begin to recover, we forget all those people who are still long-term unemployed. Yep. And I am pleased that in the, in, in the, in the Biden-Harris administration as part of the economic team, uh, we have a number of uh, folks who have worked with us on this proposal. Um, uh, Jared Bernstein, Heather, others. Uh, and I think they recognize that this is something that we have to do early on in, in January. Right. We, we can't leave, we sh it'd be unconscionable for the Congress to leave in December without providing people with some lifeboat and safety net. Oh my God. But this next measure has to happen early in the next administration. It's gotta be bold. It's yeah. gotta be bold. It's gotta be bold. We, we have to yeah. go yeah. fight for it. That's right. And uh, it's, it's going to take some some work. But but you see, I think that the public is poised. I mean, when you look at the opinion polling on this, sometimes some 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 uh, some members of Congress are so out of touch. Right. They're actually time warped. <laughs> yeah. Living in another era. That's you know, they, they, they still think it's the Reagan era. That was 40 years ago. They're still yeah. dreaming of Ronald Reagan, Arthur Laffer, and uh, the, the I call it the laugh curve. Yeah, well, it was, <laughs> it was about worth as much as the napkin it was written on. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the laugh well, let curve. me um, really thank, thank, thank you, both thank of you. you and your teams and organizations for what you're doing to help end poverty in America and make sure that everybody has a chance yeah. to make it. I mean, it's this, well, as you say, it's just that kind of common sense, Mark. Let me turn it over to the two of you to make any kind of yeah, all I'll final say comments. Is, Senator, and, and I'll give Melissa the last word. Thanks for having us. And let's just take this, I think, a lot of the goodwill and good discussion today. And let's go see if uh, 
if uh, in January and, and early February, this is uh, something we can uh, we can include. I mean, I think we got to push. That's right. Uh, on uh, on the economic team in the new administration, I think we got to build some consensus in the Congress uh, around it and uh, and and some grassroots support. So uh, I'm committed to working on it with you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well I'm grateful for for. Melissa? Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to say cosign on that. And thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I think I think you're right, Mark. I think we've got to push um, on this. Um, we, we can't continue to do things like we've done, right? Or we're going to have far too many people who can't get access to the labor market long term. And that's not good for any of us, right? Um, so thank you for your support on this. And thank you for your work on this. Um, we look forward to working alongside you. Thank you. Well, thank thank you both so much, and thank all of uh, all the folks who have joined us uh, in this conversation. We're going to count on all the folks viewing this to be part of our our, our team pushing to get That's this right. over the finish line. That's thank right. Thank you all. Make